Greetings and salutations, friends, and welcome back to another 40k lore video. In today's video, we'll be having a look at the Enigmatic Elder. Now, originally, as I said earlier, I thought I would do all of the Empire videos first, and only then move on to the other factions, but as the sheer number of videos possible became apparent to me, I figured that some variety might be good. And so we arrive at this pointy-eared junction with the Eldar. This particular breed of space elf has been around for a very long time indeed, hence the name. Though the Eldar are not the oldest race in the galaxy, not by a long shot, but that is a subject for another video. After all, if I keep giving you boys everything in a single massive video, who would pay for my soda with my tiny little ad revenue, huh? So, patience, my dear friends, we will be getting to the enigmatic creators of the Eldar, and, by the way, the Orcs, at a later date. Back to the point, though. The Eldar were, as I already hinted at, created essentially as living weapons, designed alongside many other races to fight a war unlike any other war so massive that entire space-faring civilizations could be grown and expended like simple ammunition. A war so enormous the galaxy of the 41st millennium was but one of the many theatres of war. In this war, the Eldar were created as precision instruments and blessed with considerable abilities, both intellectually and psychically, and these gifts, along with almost supernatural speed and grace, more than make up for their somewhat lacking brawn. In ages long past, when humans were still busying themselves with hitting rabbits over the head with sticks and making cave paintings out of spunk, the Eldar had a massive galaxy-spanning empire and had developed technology so advanced that it would appear closer to magic than tech. But, even though this technology was mostly taught to them by the enigmatic creators of the Eldar race, being far more advanced even than them in technology, the Eldar Empire crumbled, and these days there are but a relative handful left. We will get back to that later though, as uh, there's quite the story to be told, uh, but first, let's cover some of the basics, shall we? Let's have a look at the Eldar him slash her self. Now, it looks almost human, yes? They're quite tall and thin by human standards, and there's slightly elongated faces, are uh, sharper and finer of feature than us mere primates, but they could still be mistaken for either a human in poor lighting, but this misunderstanding is only possible until they begin to move. The Eldar almost flow across the ground in a fashion that is completely unmistakable when compared to the barbarous ape-like movements of us poor Homo sapiens. This is due to the Eldar's much, much faster metabolism than humans. Their cardiac and neurological systems are far more advanced and effective, and this results in the Eldar having vastly heightened senses and control over their movements, along with a greatly increased lifespan, often stretching over the course of thousands, if not tens of thousands of years. So, combining virtually endless experience in all manners of things and their ridiculously heightened senses compared to humans, it looks like we primitives are moving in slow motion. Ungainly and unrefined in movement and actions, and to make it worse, since the Eldar are capable of controlling their bodies to a much greater extent than us underdeveloped animals, they find our constant secretion of sweat and our smell and our very breathing to be extremely barbaric. Not to mention our language, which by Eldar standards is little better than grunting and moaning. Something most Eldar find it extremely hard to deal with. To them, talking to one of us vestigial creatures is 
comparable to a human having a conversation with a poo-flinging baboon high on LSD. These things all combine to make the Eldar a remarkably arrogant species, and perhaps rightfully so. And this is quite the common theme with the Eldar. They hold us barbarians in utter contempt. They consider us little better than vermin. A thousand human lives are not worth that of a single Eldar, as they are immeasurably superior to us sad monkeys in every possible way, at least according to your average Eldar. And it's not just us poor humans, though, that the Eldar consider to be so remarkably inferior. In fact, they consider pretty much all races to be far, far below their notice, and rarely deign to engage in anything so mundane as communication with the lesser races. And it should be noted that they hold us humans in particular contempt simply because, well, they blame us for pretty much everything that is wrong in the universe, uh, mostly due to their own previous failings. We are almost a kind of a broken reflection of the Eldar, and the Eldar hate that to an absolutely remarkable extent. But, moving. This whole arrogant thing, as you may imagine, complicates diplomacy to a rather considerable degree, at least when the Eldar can be asked to engage in such things with us primitives. Though after the rise of man, the Eldar have had to engage in such uh, tasteless acts far more often than they would have liked. Previously to the rise of man, the Empire of the Eldar gave virtually no shits about the lesser races, we were less than an annoyance, but, um, well, we've come a long way since our tadpole days. During the Great Crusade, there were instances of more or less peaceful negotiations between Eldar and man, although they usually didn't end as peacefully as they began. The other way of holding all other in complete and utter contempt, and making it blindingly obvious that they do so, is a very good way indeed to piss off even the most diplomatically minded of space marines. In the current day, though, negotiations between Eldar and humans have become more, um, common, I guess is the word. If we can even use it for something so absurdly rare, but at least it's more common than during the Great Crusade. Not because the Eldar have somehow re-evaluated us poor Neanderthals, but because we own pretty much all of the galaxy at this point, and the Eldar simply don't have the numbers to fight us anymore. On the other hand, while the Imperium could handle a crush, what is left of the dwindling Eldar race, it is a question of priorities. Destroying the Eldar would require the application of considerable crusade-level forces, and would span over pretty much every single imperial segmentum. It would consume titanic numbers of men and equipment, as well as monstrous naval forces. The organization alone would take decades and require hundreds of generals and tens of thousands of scribes and planners, and the campaign itself would quite possibly take centuries. All this would considerably weaken the Imperium on countless fronts, and for what? The Eldar are tiny mosquito compared to the larger threats of the galaxy. It can sting, it can annoy, it might even draw a trickle of blood, but in the end it poses no real threat. Especially not, again, when compared to the ravages of the Tyranids, the corruptions or chaos or marauding greenskins. And the Eldar are very much so aware of this. 
Most craft worlds, and we'll get to what a craft world is later, do whatever they can to avoid open conflict with the Imperium and any other larger threats, really. They will happily attack Imperial forces, or indeed any other alien forces, if they present a threat to the Eldar interests, but will always try to avoid making it a large or drawn-out conflict. They will fight to defend one of their Maiden worlds, for example, and uh, I will explain the whole Maiden world things in a moment, a moment relatively speaking, and they will destroy Imperial forces whose actions may in some way endanger the Alda. Again, same for other forces, be they Orcs, Tyranids, Chaos, Tau, whatever really. But these actions are always highly surgical and focused in their nature. They attack and destroy their target and then withdraw so as to not appear too large a threat. For example, let's say the Imperium settles a Maiden world and the settlers are killed by the Eldar. The Eldar will not stay on the planet, they will strike and then they will leave. This way the Imperium is mildly annoyed, but with no Eldar forces on the planet to strike back against, there is no real lasting threat to other Imperial interests nearby. And so, more often than not, the Imperial simply ignores these worlds. The planet deemed unworthy of the forces necessary to ensure control of it. On other occasions, the Eldar have been known to assist Imperial forces both directly and indirectly, and all this friend-foe nonsense has left the Imperium quite confused when it comes to the Eldar. On occasions, they help us, on others, they attack seemingly without provocation, and yet other times they actually ask for assistance, or even render it without being requested. To put it simply, the Eldar think and act in a way we poor apes neither can, or want for that matter, to understand. And there is, in fact, a reason for this. You see, the Eldar are extremely psychically gifted, and over the millennia they have honed this gift to a razor's edge, enabling them to foresee the future. They can see future events and their ramifications, sometimes only a few days or weeks at a time, or even mere hours, and other times they can chart the course of events over years and years and possibly even decades and centuries. This could, for example, enable them to see a future in which an, um, at the time, minor and insignificant imperial world rises to such prominence and power that it will one day enable the Imperium to raise enough forces in the local area to forever put nearby Eldar maiden worlds beyond their reach. This would prompt the Eldar to attack the world, either removing the current settlements completely or preferably they will target the people that would make the world great. Let's, for example, say that the local governor was a talented and resourceful individual that would bring about the planet's rise to power. All the Elder would have to do is remove that one individual and ensure his successor is the local village idiot's retarded brother. In this way, the Eldar is capable of averting a threat to their future interests before they have even formed and the Empire will, in more due cases, be none the wiser. The local Imperial governor of a backwater world was assassinated, and nobody really cares, and so in the entire event would pass by unnoticed by the Imperium on a larger scale. However, though, before you start thinking that the Eldar are completely invincible, seeing as they can foresee the future, bear in mind that the art of divination is ludicrously complex, and becomes harder and harder the longer one looks into the future. Every action taken by the Eldar 
could spawn hundreds, if not thousands, of new possible futures. Some radically different, some virtually identical. And shifting through all of these myriad possibilities to find that one true precious future it could be compared to finding a single specific grain of sand in a continent spanning desert a continent spanning desert by the way that continuously grows we will get back to the um, subject of eldar psychic powers and how they affect their way of war in basic forms relatively soon and in far fuller terms in a later video, or in fact probably a series of videos. But for now, let's have a look at the events that caused the fall of the once mighty Eldar Empire and left them in this somewhat sorry state that they find themselves in in the modern galaxy. To truly understand just how far the Eldar have fallen though, we first need to take a look at the heights of their empire. After the Great War, the Eldar remained as the sole dominant force in the galaxy. Their creators, the mysterious Old Ones, had made several other races, and even more naturally evolved races were spread across the galaxies. But none of them could even come close to the Eldar in terms of technology and power, and so there was really nothing to stop the Eldar from claiming what was left of their old master's galactic domain. And they also adopted much of their technologies for their own use, including their almost complete control over the warp. You see, Back then, the warp was not the hostile realms of chaos it is today. Back then, the mechanics of the warp was practically completely understood by the old ones, and they could shape it to suit their needs. And many of these techniques were passed on to the Eldar. Although these teachings were to prove fatally flawed, but we'll get to that later. For the moment, the Eldar had not only complete control over the material universe and the galaxy as a whole, with the other races consigned to small pockets of resistance, or perhaps zoos would be a better word, but they also had masteries over the immaterium of the warp itself and could wield it as a weapon. The Eldar created gods within the warp, but these were not the intelligent and self-serving gods of the Chaos Pantheon. These gods were essentially immensely powerful tools that the Eldar could direct and control pretty much however they wished. And so, with the powers of the very gods themselves at their command, the Eldar transcended all of life's minor worries. They didn't need to work or Fight, all necessary tasks, both economical and military, were carried out by automatons and their essentially enslaved gods. As you may imagine, this left the Eldar themselves somewhat bored, really, with nothing to do. Immediately, this seemed not to be much of a problem. The Eldar nation remained strong and secure with what few borders it still had, being ever pushed forward by armies of automatons and their essentially enslaved gods, and the Eldars themselves lived endless lives of luxury and indulgence. They had, in fact, even conquered death. Now, the Eldar, even in the modern time, are virtually immortal. They live for an incredibly long period of time. They do die of aging at some point, but it takes thousands upon thousands upon thousands of years. But back then, when an Eldar died, his spirit entered the warp, the realm of the Eldar's gods. At that time, the Chaos Gods were virtually non-existent. They were barred off by strong, powerful walls in the Immaterium. And so, the spirits of the Eldar were virtually completely safe 
and were, when they so wished it, reborn anew into the realm of flesh and blood. At the time, the warp was far from a place of terror for the Elder, but a confirmed afterlife. They could all return from if they so wished. It was a massive safety net, you could almost call it. However, even a life of endless luxury and the guarantee of resurrection would eventually become boring over the course of hundreds and then thousands of years. And so the Eldar began exploring ever more um, stimulating activities. To begin with, the Eldar moderated their excesses and focused them into truly marvelous works of art, architecture, and many things besides, but over the years even this became boring. The Eldar began craving more and more, and they began to see themselves as invincible, and <laughs> honestly, who could really argue with them at that point? The galaxy, at that point, was not merely theirs to conquer, but it was already theirs, and it was theirs by divine right, <laughs> quite literally, seeing as they had created their own gods. The galaxy was theirs for all eternity, and all that was left to conquer was boredom. Slowly but surely, the Eldar embraced ever greater excesses, and soon so-called pleasure cults started appearing on virtually all the Eldar worlds. To begin with, these pleasure cults were simple venues for orgies and sexual and other indulgencies, but mere pleasures of the sensual flesh soon became dull, boring, so the cults began offering more um, tantalizing activities. At this point, the cult's customers had already explored almost every type of sexual vices, and so the cult got some um, creative. The Eldar as a race gradually declined into a cruel and hedonistic society, where the border between pleasure and pain was ever blurred and pushed, until the Eldar race almost as a complete whole degraded into complete anarchy. Blood-crazed murderers roamed the streets, and families turned on each other in orgies of violence and torture the galaxy had never seen before. This sensation of degradation, of panic, of pain, suffering, became so overpowering to the senses and the emotions unleashed during the last days of the Elder Empire became so powerful that it forever changed the very fabric of the warp itself. But, Arch, you may say, this is all very dramatic and all, but how did this shatter an entire galactic empire? I mean, surely some bastions of law and order remain to curve the excesses of this galactic drinking binge. Well, eh, the mere anarchy and murder stick was merely an appetizer, really, for what was to come next. As I have previously talked about, the warp is a reflection of the material world, and such violent excess had a profound effect on the warp, and it was this, really, that hammered the final nail into the Eldar coffin. Because for all their bluster, for all their supposed superiority, for all their hatred of the lesser races as mere barbarians doing a little more than destroying the Eldar are the only race in the galaxy that can lay claim to the dubious honor of giving birth to a Chaos God. After slowly maturing in the warp for decades, possibly even millennia, feeding on the heightened emotions of the Eldar as they devolved ever further into the cult of pleasure. The Chaos God Slanesh 
dark prince of pleasure was, for lack of a better word, born. This birth consumed the lives of millions of Eldar across thousands of light years. Their very souls were sucked into the warp to fuel the awakening of this new god. But the Eldar themselves were not the only ones to suffer the wrath of this fresh deity. Up until this point, the warp had been a strictly controlled and regulated entity, focused and harnessed into a tool and a weapon of the Eldar. But with the birth of Slanesh, the carefully calibrated balance of the warp was in a single instance irreparably destroyed. The Eldar gods that had been created as tools of order and control fought the newborn prince and attempted to contain him, as they had the other chaotic forces, and if the Eldar race was still a unified entity in control of their emotions and knowledge, perhaps they would have succeeded. Before I proceed though, at this point you may be a little confused if you have watched my previous video on the warp in relation to Warhammer Fantasy. So let me try to shed some light on the matter. You see, in 40k, the Old Ones and the Eldar knew the Warp was capable of producing gods. They also knew that these gods are fully reliant on us mortals for their powers and even their very motivations. As an example, if millions of Eldar all harnessed their incredible control over their minds into believing in a god of construction that would bless architects with marvelous ideas and skills to actually build these wonders of engineering, then that god would be created and would have those powers and those motives. If a race is capable of focusing their beliefs and minds towards such singular purpose, the gods of the warp become little more than tools to be applied with full control and precision, rendering the magic of the warp into cold, hard, controllable science. Of course, some baser instincts would still always exist, such impulses and emotions like fear of death and disease, ergo Nurgle. Or the wish for a better tomorrow, Urko change, and thereby Zinch, or just good old anger that would empower Korn. But in the society the Eldar had created, they had built walls around these emotions. After all, why would you fear death when you are simply reborn? Why want for change when you have everything you could ever want, and anger? The Eldar lived in an ideal world of peace and plenty. What little anger there was would be not be enough to grant corn the power to sour milk, much less spawn legions of demons. And yet, these gods were always there, in the background, feeding on the emotions of the lesser races and whatever slivers of power that slipped out of the Eldar paradise, ever gnawing at the walls of the Eldar gods that they had constructed there to shield their people. As long as the Eldar, as the by far dominant force in the galaxy, remained strong, however, these walls would never crumble. But all walls require maintenance, and the walls of the Eldar had been left neglected and weakened while the Eldar pursued more delightful ventures. And so, with the birth of Slanesh and the death of the overwhelming majority of the Eldar population, the walls that had been keeping out the monsters crumbled to dust. What little resistance the Eldar gods could offer was overwhelmed in a tidal wave of chaos, and the relative handful of Eldar that remained had nowhere close to the power that would be required to re-imprison them. And speaking of reminders, not all Eldar died during the fall. Many Eldar had long sensed that something horrible was about to happen and had taken steps to distance themselves from their kin. Others were already far distant from the main Eldar culture and its slow decline. 
These Eldars were the inhabitants of the craft worlds. Massive, self-sufficient, space-faring cities, or, well, actually cities, too small of a term, as each craft world could be considered an independent nation with its own culture and traditions. Perhaps continents would be a better term. Before the fall, these craft worlds were essentially supermassive trading caravans that travelled the Eldar Empire at sub-light speeds, visiting other Eldar worlds only a few times during a thousand years. As such, they remained virtually untouched by the slowly spreading corruption that had infected their brethren, and were greatly alarmed by the direction their empire appeared to be heading in. So they isolated themselves even further, and while the corrupted parts of the Eldar population were incapable of feeling the growing threat of chaos and slanesh, it became increasingly obvious to the Croftwell Eldar, who essentially began to flee their own empire. Stopping only briefly to bring along anyone still sound of mind, they headed out towards the stars and away from the core of the Eldar Empire as fast as their sublight engines could propel them. For many craft walls, however, this was not fast enough, but several did make it to a safe distance and watched in horror as the centre of their once proud mighty empire was wrenched into a warp, creating what we know today as the Ocularis Terribus, the Eye of Terror. And the Eldar's troubles do not end there. After the Great War, the galaxy was smothered in warp storms, a side effect of the Eldar's containment of the forces of chaos, forces that continuously attempted to break loose and regain control of the warp and their home territory, so to say, thereby creating endless storms in the Immaterium, which, again, may travel through it virtually impossible for the lesser races, and limiting them, thereby, to sub-light speed travel, while the Eldar were able to use their systems of webways to travel the warp through artificially created tunnels. But more on that in another video. Back to the point, though. With the birth of Slanesh, the chaotic forces broke free of their confines, and like a dam bursting, they spread themselves across the massive plains that the Eldar had so far denied them. And so, the massive storm was spread out over a massive area, all of his energy expended in this massive push to break down what remained of the Eldar's god's defences. And so, the storms that had been covering the galaxy abated, and became local disturbances rather than the galaxy-spanning tempest it once was. But how does this make life worse for the Eldar, you may ask? Well, the thing is that now the Eldar aren't the only ones that can travel at faster than light speeds. With the warp open for travel again, suddenly the lesser races were spreading like wildfire across the galaxies, finishing off any lingering hope the Eldar may have had of rebuilding their empire. And, in particular, there was one race of hairless monkeys that set out from the otherwise insignificant planet of Terra that would prove themselves a constant problem for the Eldar. With all that in mind, you may well imagine this was an ever so slightly traumatic event for the Eldar race, with their core worlds, their so-called crown worlds, lost to the eye, and with virtually all of its citizens dead, the Eldar Empire was at an end. Its people scattered and separated, the craft walls had always been fiercely independent, but united by common heritage, while now all the heritage they had in common was the death and destruction of their race. They did agree on one thing though, the Eldar had strayed far from their original path, and from now on all Eldar were required to curb their wishes and wants. To aid in this endeavour, they developed the Path System. Every Eldar will select for himself a focus, 
and he will, from that moment on, dedicate himself fully to the perfection of his path, for however long it may take until he achieves full mastery of his chosen discipline. And then, when full mastery is achieved, he simply starts anew on a different path, and so on and so on and so on. Though it should be noted that each new path does not completely override the old focus, but simply adds to the individual's accumulated experience, allowing the Eldar to view life in all of its forms and sides and through these pursuits gain a unique grasp of the universe and his or her place in it. This system is not without its dangers, however, as the Eldar mind is quite different from that of our own. Imagine, if you will, that you could think a thousand times faster than you can now. Imagine you could be presented with a puzzle, and your mind would not merely begin to solve the puzzle itself, but also start pondering its meaning, its origin, its production and invention, the origins of the exact materials used to make it, and the origins of these materials' subparticles and their meanings and implications on the greater whole, etc, etc, etc. To an Eldar, even the simplest thing can be an immensely complex puzzle. So, when they begin to study something of extreme complexity, they risk losing themselves in their task and becoming unable to ever leave their chosen path for another. Forevermore obsessing and pondering the most minute detail of their chosen profession to a degree that is quite simply impossible for humans. The Eldar call such individuals the Lost, as they are forevermore bound to a single pursuit and will never get to experience the true diversity and glory of the material world. Now, the paths of a warlike nature alone are quite numerous, and they and other paths will be covered to a lesser or greater degree in a separate video, but to start finishing up this video, I would like to talk a bit about Eldar Warfare, as it is quite unique in the galaxy, as it relies almost entirely on extremely specialized warrior organizations that are organized into pseudo-religious warrior temples that train their warriors to a standard and ability far beyond that of mere mortals. And when this training and dedication is paired with the Eldar weaponry so advanced it makes the works of us primordial baboons appear little better than sticks and stones painted in fanciful colours. The result is potent indeed. Eldar weaponry, armour and vehicles will all be covered, or at the very least I'll do my best to cover the vast majority of them, in several separate videos, so for now I will merely touch upon some of the main traits of Eldar Warfare. To make the most out of these extremely specialised warriors, the Eldar way of battle is centred around manoeuvre and positioning. They seek to place themselves and their enemies into a position where they may maximize their own advantages while minimizing that of, the, of their enemies. An Eldar Assault is a perfectly timed dance of nuanced maneuvers and perfectly timed strikes. They'll frustrate an enemy with long-range fire to draw him into pursuit leading him into close and confined areas where they may be set upon by the many close combat specialists the Eldar possess. And while most forces would find such complex strategies challenging in the extreme, or even flat out impossible to carry out in battlefield conditions, the Eldar commanders are supremely skilled, with centuries or even millennia of experience to draw upon and with the aid of the Eldar Farseers, they are capable of planning not only the operation itself, but even foresee and circumvent the enemy's counter-moves before they have even thought of them themselves. 
As you may imagine, this gives them a pretty damn severe advantage over most of the lesser races, but at the cost of ferociously complex and detailed plans that need to be carried out to perfection to ensure victory at the smallest possible cost of Eldar lives. To this end, the Eldar value speed above all else and have developed a myriad of anti-gravity platforms upon which to mount their heavier weapons, along with a great numbers of transports using a more powerful versions of the same technology. These heavier platforms are even capable of flight for a limited amount of time. The Eldar are also possessed of a limited form of teleportation technology that lets them travel with extreme speed between previously fixed points via the webways. And all of this mobility serves but one simple purpose, to deliver the maximum amount of force to the perfectly chosen point at the precisely chosen time, thereby making up for the Eldar's limited numbers and minimizing Eldar casualties while maximizing the damage of the enemy. But again, before you start thinking the Eldar invincible and overpowered, Remember that this is a strategy not necessarily formed from choice, but one birthed from desperation, and it comes with some quite obvious limitations. The Eldar are extremely lacking in manpower or Eldar power, and rely on perfectly executed plans to nullify that disadvantage, which means that if their plans are in some way disrupted, the consequences can be devastating, as the forces of the craftworld Eliatok found out to their cost during their incursions on the Imperial world of Betalis III, and more on that particular fight in a later video. But this in particular uh, lesson came in the form of a company of Space Wolves. The Space Wolves refused to dance to the Eldar's tune, and overcoming perfectly laid ambushes with sheer determination and fury, they unhinged the Eldar's plans, turning what had earlier appeared a completely one-sided Eldar victory into one of the costliest lessons ever learned by the craftworld Eliasic. And while such defeats are certainly rare, the Eldar cannot afford even the most uncommon of defeats, as their numbers are ever dwindling. To this end, the Eldar avoid battle wherever possible, preferring to lure the other races into doing the dirty work for them. However, sometimes the Eldar must fight to preserve what they consider theirs. For example, the Eldar will risk great damage to themselves to preserve their so-called Maiden Worlds, once barren planets that the Eldar began terraforming long before the fall a process that would take tens of thousands of years and have only recently come to fruition. In the current Imperium, these worlds are lush and verdant paradise worlds, sought by many of the galaxy's races, the Imperium often foremost amongst them. The Eldar consider these worlds not only sacred ground, promising to them by their blessed ancestors, but as the only real hope that yet remains to their race. And so, the Eldar defend these worlds vehemently, hoping to be able to erect proper colonies upon them. But therein lies the problem. The only reason the Eldar are still alive is their ability to outmaneuver their enemies and fade away from hostile intentions. The moment they settle down, they nail themselves to an objective that must be defended. It is a hard choice for the Eldar to make you continuing their existence ever dwindling between the stars, forever limited by the craft walls that they live upon, or risk complete annihilation in return for the hope of a bright future. And while I have earlier mentioned that the Imperium have, on upon occasion, had diplomatic dealings with the Eldar, the Imperium could never be entreated to simply ignore these settlements. Remember, the only reason the Eldar yet exist is the simple fact that the Imperium is not willing to expend the resources and take the risks required to finish them off. But 
When the Eldar established colonies upon the Imperial worlds, well, that's another thing entirely. Uh, simply put, if the Eldar were to remain in one place for any extended period of time, the Imperium would almost certainly have a go at them, as the potential to wipe out a large number of these raiders is a valuable opportunity indeed. But what if all the Eldar would somehow cooperate? and create a single colony, would that somehow work? Not really. Even if all the Eldar in the current galaxy could somehow cooperate for long enough to defend a single colony world in the hope of re-establishing some small part of their empire, and again, craft worlds are not very cooperative to begin with, so uh, to think that they would all somehow be able to work together against such a unified goal is... Uh, hopeful, to say the absolute least, and again, even if all of them could, if all of the Eldar population was centred on a single planet, ah, oh, the Imperium would be over that in moment. Such a fantastic prize, the extermination of the Eldar, and all they'd have to do is throw men at a single planet instead of scouring the endless depths of space for them. Yeah, it, uh, it probably would not work. But, again, the Elders do want to at least have a attempt at creating colonies, and so they create small colonies and hide them with advanced technologies. Colonies small enough so that if they are detected, they can be very quickly evacuated, thereby minimizing the risk, and scattering these colonies across different planets again, decreasing the risk that any large, significant blow can be dealt to their population. But, of course, this also means that uh, any hopes of rebuilding the Empire is going to be a long and drawn-out process indeed, uh, but it is also, in all due likelihood, their best hope, simply because the Imperium cannot defend all of these planets individually, or, well, they could, but to do this would require large garrisoning forces to be placed on every single maiden world, which would in all due likelihood just simply be too much of a stretch on the Empire's resources to be worth it. And of course, that's only counting the Imperium, which is not the only race out there hostile to the Eldar. The Tyranid will happily nom nom Eldars just as they will humans. And while orcs prefer opponents with a bit more backbone and will to stand and fight, well, needs must when the devil drives. And these races are not quite that bad though, as they're more yeah, easily predictable, I suppose you could say. And as such, the Eldar have a relatively simple time avoiding them, or maybe even using them for their own purposes as they can, with a fair bit of certainty, predict their actions and move to distance themselves from any potential harm. Although, as in uh, the case of the Craft World of Yandan, this is not always possible. Nevertheless, these races, are, relatively speaking, are fairly unthreatening compared to, for example, the Imperium, whom, by virtue of sheer size, is nigh on impossible to avoid. But, the Imperium, as we have already talked about, consider the Eldar a fairly minor threat, and will usually leave them alone unless, of course, opportunity to screw them over presents itself. And while the Necrons would happily piss oil on any Eldar grave that they come across, they are for the moment limited in their actions by numbers even more limited than the Eldar. But the true threat to the Eldar in all your reality comes from the very thing that once shattered their empire. Chaos. You see, Chaos, and in particular Slaanesh, value Eldar souls above all others, like a man might value the finest steak over a basest scrap. And the Eldar seek to cheat Chaos of this feast by binding their souls upon death into spirit stones, 
thereby avoiding the fairly uncomfortable fate that awaits them at the non-too-tender mercies of the creatures of the warp. And this is why they fear the force of chaos above all others. Not only will chaos pursue the Eldar beyond all reason or thought of cost and gains, but they will make damn sure that the Eldar spirit stones are all ground to dust to ensure that the souls of the lost are all sent to the warp's warm embrace. And as already mentioned, Sanesh is extremely keen on getting his loving hands on the souls of the Eldar that escaped his grasp upon his birth. And so, if a budding champion of chaos wished to gain the favour of the Dark Prince, there is no better currency with which to purchase it than the souls of the Eldar. And we all know that the Champions of Chaos tend to be quite aggressive in their pursuit of favour. And so, this is where we find the Eldar in the 41st millennium. A dwindling race beset on all sides by enemies and forced into a guerrilla-style war of hit and run on a galactic scale. Their future is not a bright one, but all hope is still not lost. The Eldar possess knowledge and technology enough to keep themselves alive in an extremely hostile galaxy, and perhaps with time, the Eldar, discipline and planning will once again see them rise to prominence in a galaxy they once called their own. Only time will tell. Until the next time though, I have been Arch, thank you very much for watching, and I hope to see you soon with some more lore videos. Until then, have a good day.